We have three o'clock, almost one minute past. So I, I would say let's start. Um, hello to everyone and um, especially uh, to the speakers on this group and also the audience. It's great that you, that you join us all. Hi everyone. My name is Axel Haus. Um, so I'm, the, I'm, I'm active in the research department um, for Selective. And today we are proud to kick off our Selective ESG spring webinar series, which is a series of five webinars. Um, and we start today with a panel discussion around the topic of biological diversity, or in short, biodiversity. We have a highly relevant group of speakers. It's very interesting because, um, as you will soon notice uh, when I introduce the speakers and as they speak, uh, they all have a quite diverse background, which is, um, which is um, complementary and, and in this respect, um, very insightful and great. And um, the, the three um, people joining us today will provide their insights and knowledge in the field of biodiversity. So we have Erika Sanella, who is part of the data and index team at Vigeo Iris. And Vigeo Iris is a rating and research agency and a provider of ESG data, as well as services to the investment community. Erika's team is very active in gathering and structuring data for ESG indices. And she is also an expert on biodiversity. And she also delivered already um, insightful data on biodiversity indices. Then we have Clinton Adas, who is a global ESG product specialist at legal and general investment management. And at Elgin, Clinton works on investment stewardship initiatives, and he leads the team's endeavors towards biodiversity work. And Clinton is truly a motivated expert, as he is currently completing his PhD on animal and environmental law, biodiversity and conservation at Queen Mary University in London. And in parallel, he's also conducting his master's studies in sustainability at Harvard University, besides his um, already um, great and relevant education that, that he already um, has completed. Then we have Peter Elwin, who works for the NGO called Planet Tracker. And Peter is a financial expert and um, at Planet Tracker, which is a nonprofit financial think tank. He pretty much aligns capital markets with planetary boundaries. He is the director of fixed income. Thus, he engages on the debt side of investing, and he incorporates ESG factors and sustainability into bond investments. He's also the head of program at Planet Tracker. So that's a great group of speakers. Um, so welcome, all of you. It's, um, it's, a, it's a pleasure that we can do this together today. And I would like to kick it off with a fairly simple question. So to each of you personally, why is biodiversity relevant from your perspective and to your organization? Maybe Erica, if you want to start um, on the relevance of the topic biodiversity for you. Yes, sure. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm Erika Zanella um, from uh, VE. Um, so personally, um, biodiversity is really important for me. Uh, really connected to the environment and uh, and climate also uh, i studied it uh, during my studies at university and uh, in ve uh, biodiversity is uh, is really important because it's uh, is a crucial part of our uh, analysis and uh, and assessment as uh, as axel said um, our job is to evaluate companies uh, based on esg so environment, social, and governance. And biodiversity is a, is a crucial subject on, uh, on environment uh, and is part of our methodology since, uh, since, the, since, since the beginning. So it's, uh, it's a really crucial, uh, crucial point uh, for, uh, for me. Great, thanks. Um, Clinton, working for an investment manager um, at Elgin, how, how is it relevant to you? Sure, thanks. So, um, you know, afternoon, um, to pick up on some of the earlier points, I think biodiversity, like climate change, is really one of the biggest challenges we're facing at the moment. Um, and financial institutions have a crucial role to play um, in helping to 
prevent or slow down this biodiversity loss through, uh, you know, the funding or the companies we invest in. Um, and indeed, you know, it starts with the fiduciary duty we would have to our clients' assets. But I think it's really more than just this duty um, and, you know, looking at it from risks and opportunities. It comes down to something that's very personal in that our very livelihoods depend on biodiversity um, and our relationship with nature. You know, it impacts our food, it impacts our water, uh, the health. We're all sitting at home, or most of us are sitting at home today because of, of COVID. And, you know, um, the links there seem quite clear towards biodiversity. But again, taking it down to a very personal level, um, it's core to a lot of our cultures. It's nature's key to the way we relax. When we want to relax, we go out for a walk or uh, try and enjoy the environment. So it's very difficult to try and capture what biodiversity means to everybody. But I think um, that's that's a good start. And I think personally, when, when we see these statistics of um, you know, wildlife loss or biodiversity declining by around 60%, it's quite horrific statistics. So um, it's definitely something that's important to all of us. Yeah, interesting. So, so you touched upon responsibility already, right? And this is maybe uh, maybe um, the, the word for Peter. So Peter, you, you, you work for a nonprofit think tank. And when I, when I previously talked to you, I definitely heard that responsibility is, is something important to you. So same question, why, why is biodiversity relevant in your view? Yeah, well, I, I think I'd uh, completely echo what uh, Clinton and Erica both said. I mean, and, and particularly the fact that biodiversity is the sort of the support network, if you like, on which humanity rests and on which our economy rests. And, and without it, uh, the planet will carry on, but humanity definitely won't. And I think it's always interesting people talk about saving the planet. And re in reality, what we're actually working on is saving humanity, not saving the planet. Um, and biodiversity is absolutely core to that. And uh, one of the ways that, uh, that we're very keen to sort of get companies and investors thinking more about biodiversity is uh, rather than a sort of you know extraction model, actually to start thinking more on a, a regenerative basis. Uh, I think it was very interesting out of the Das Gupta report, which obviously uh, the UK government commission was published recently. And one of the basic points Das Gupta was making uh, was that if you look at nature and, and indeed biodiversity, in general, if you leave nature alone, it will regenerate and in effect generate returns. It will generate growth, it will generate life. Um, and, uh, and so if we can encourage investors to then encourage the businesses that they're supplying the capital to, to actually allow that regenerative process to, to continue, uh, then it's actually a very capital efficient way uh, for the planet to, uh, to continue and for all of us to, to sort of have sustainable livelihoods along the lines that Clinton was outlining. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. One comment to, to everyone after the first um, round of the first question, first round of, of, of answers um, to the audience. I'm not the only one asking questions today, but you can also um, drop a line in the chat um, in the meantime, and we will pick this one, the questions up and we will uh, in the end have um, um, time for more questions, right? So that's for the audience, if there's anything unclear or if you're keen on hearing something in specific, please let us know. Great, so we, we touched upon the relevance um, for you personally, but also for the nature and humankind, but to, to move a little bit more to the economic side of things, right? Um, it's interesting to me that Okay, yeah, we observe that we are in the sixth mass extinction right now with far-reaching consequences. At the same time, we consume or we use a lot of services that the nature and the ecosystem provides to us. However, it is very difficult to quantify the services in economic terms. So let's say it's not easy to put a price tag on biodiversity services. So my question for you is, is biodiversity an underestimated factor for the economy? How do you see this? Maybe, Peter, we'll start with you this time because you touched upon the economics um, already. Yeah, and I, I, it's a great question, Axel. I, I think absolutely massively. I mean, biodiversity is not measured as part of sort of GDP, for example. Uh, it's not measured in national accounting. Uh, governments may be thinking about it a bit. Some governments perhaps more, uh, others, others less. But... In terms of our, our basic sort of economic measurements, biodiversity is not really a, a, a sort of a, a data point or a, a data cloud that's captured 
uh, in any respect. And I think if you then look at how the investment market works, I mean, sort of, you know, absent the great work people like Clinton are doing, but the vast majority of the allocation of capital uh, takes absolutely no account of biodiversity at all. And I think if you, you you find very, very few sort of industry sectors where it's really thought about clearly agriculture uh, and sort of agriculture based industries where, where sort of, you know, crop inputs are really important. They may be thinking about biodiversity, but in reality, most of the time they're actually thinking about simple yield they can get from the land and not necessarily the consequences in terms of, you know, if you've got a sort of a, a monocrop farming system where you're effectively denuding the landscape of of any other form of biodiversity because you think it increases your crop yield, that's a negative effect, but you're not thinking about the biodiversity at all. So, so I think it's, uh, it's not even underestimated. I think it's, it's a hardly thought about factor um, and certainly has been up to the very recent point. Yeah, that's, that's a great question for Erica. <laughs> yes. Erica, help us getting the data. And how, that's also a question from the audience. How do we measure the impact? Yeah, um, I would answer exactly in the same way of, uh, of Peter. Uh, at the moment, um, it's not a question of uh, underestimating biodiversity. I think to underestimate something, we, we first need to estimate it and then say that it's not important. But in fact, uh, we all agree that biodiversity is really important, but the missing point um, or what is not really clear and, uh, and generally stated is how to measure it, uh, how to put this uh, natural capital value into our analysis, into our investment strategies. And, uh, and in fact, uh, there are a lot of challenges. As, uh, as Peter was, uh, was saying before, uh, we have a huge sector, uh, sector bias, sector issue. There are some sectors that are really focused uh, and are connected with, uh, with nature in a, in a more direct way. And they can have some indicators, they can have some, uh, some policies on, on biodiversity. But even inside the sector, we can have different example of indicators and a way to, to evaluate their, their impact in, uh, in activities. And the other, the other big uh, challenge uh, at the moment is really to find a standard way to measure uh, biodiversity and to provide uh, this information to, to investors, but also to consumers, in fact. And uh, so there are, there are different ways, um, but at the beginning, I think um, now we are, we are still in a phase where uh, the most important thing is to try to do something uh, try to find uh, this uh, this way. Try to organize them. Uh, I think we will uh, we will have the time to go deep on the different way uh, that we have to to estimate biodiversity and uh, maybe also what uh, PE is trying to do. Um, but the the most important thing at the moment is really to create visibility, create strategies, uh, find um, hypothetic. Uh, items, uh, indicators, uh, uh, policy targets, uh, and, uh, and et cetera. So. Okay, but, but Erica, this, this sounds a, a bit like you are at the start of doing this and trying, but you, you do more than trying at Mugio. Yeah. You're capable of, of providing data on a set of companies um, re with respect to a biodiversity score, right? Yes, yes, exactly. As I was saying uh, at the beginning, biodiversity, we, we used to, to evaluate it uh, for companies uh, since uh, a lot of time. Um, and there are different ways to, to evaluate it. Uh, so basically, uh, for, the, for the main um, activities that we do is to evaluate company on ESG. And uh, in these terms, uh, we, we go and, uh, and see if the company has, for example, a, a policy uh, in the with the protection of, uh, of biodiversity. And not only if it is a, a policy, but also the, the implementation of this policy. So what are the means uh, that the company deploys to uh, effectively put in practice uh, this, uh, this policy? And if it is done in a, in a general scale on all the, the, the location, for example, and all the activities. And, uh, and of course, uh, what is important to see 
uh, also in terms of, uh, of reputational risks, uh, etc., is uh, important to see results and uh, any possible um, uh, event uh, that might cause uh, an implication or uh, controversy uh, for, for biodiversity protection. Um, so these are, uh, are uh, measurements and uh, analysis that we, we are doing um, and uh, that are already available for, uh, for our clients. Another thing that is, uh, is important and is, is, of course, a way to do it is to focus on uh, some activities that might be harmful for biodiversity. Um, it's, for example, uh, the production of uh, MGOs or um, uh, intensive farming, uh, intensive uh, agriculture. Uh, these are all um, activities uh, that can be, uh, for example, excluded from uh, an investment uh, strategy. Um, and on the other end, we can have a look on uh, some activities and products that might be um, helpful for uh, biodiversity protection. So some products that, uh, for example, bio-based uh, uh, chemicals uh, that can yeah. substitute something that it's already there, uh, but it's uh, more um, helpful for, uh, for biodiversity. Okay. Yeah, interesting. So, so a lot of what you said is directly relevant for the work that Clinton does, right? So um, working for, for Elgin, Clinton, you, in, in this field of ESG and biodiversity, you have to, to be the user of such data and incorporate it into your funds and investment strategies and portfolios, right? So how successful are you in doing this? How does it work? Um, that's a good question. Um, in terms of the data that's currently available, I think um, there are certain pockets of data available, but overall, I would say that data still remains one of the most significant challenges we, we face um, in terms of the sense that you've got lots of different pockets and different providers, but there isn't yet a front runner in terms of consistency of data that can be used. So. So I think the point we're at now really is um, companies are starting to think about how they can consider the impact of, on biodiversity and, and ways in which we need to address that. But but the data is not entirely uh, where it needs to be yet. So so I think what 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 we're really doing at this stage is um, trying to contribute to initiatives where uh, they're looking to standardize data. So for example, one of the initiatives that uh, we're a member of the observer group is the TNFD. They're trying to look to sort of put together a degree of standardized uh, metrics that people can report against and, and ask for. Um, so that's one of the areas that, that we can work against. But um, on the journey to getting to this closer to perfect solution of data, I don't think, I don't think we should be inactive and do nothing. I think um, we already know what some of the main drivers of biodiversity loss are. So you've got your pollution, deforestation, um, climate change, uh, obviously you've got invasive species and the list goes a little bit on. But so, so with that knowledge already, we can start to act. There's already um, ample data out there on things like deforestation. So we can already start engaging with companies on deforestation, looking at their supply chains. Um, so I think, you know, still work to be done, but, but doesn't mean we can't do anything in the meantime. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, so, so Peter, um, let, let me follow up with a question for you. You uh, primarily work in the field of bonds and, 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 uh, and debt, corporate debt and state debt. And there are some things are more harmonized. So for example, it is a bit easier to build a green bond um, universe, right? Than it is for, let's say, we want to have a high biodiversity score bond portfolio. So can you touch upon generally harmonizing data in the ESG space, but also especially in biodiversity? Yeah, I think, I mean, Clinton's really sort of hit the nail on the head. There, there are sort of, there are pockets of data, um, but it's a, it's a massive challenge at the moment. And, and I think from our perspective, we see, if you like, sort of nature being maybe 10 years behind the climate debate uh, at the moment. And I think if you look at the way the climate uh, sort of debate and the focus on carbon footprint and, and climate change, you look at the way that's moved, 
you know, now we've got a sort of common language, people talking about two degree targets or one and a half degree targets, people talking about CO2 equivalents as a sort of a, a measurement metric. Uh, and a lot of data, which is becoming more and more consistent, which is actually being disclosed by companies, largely still on a voluntary basis, which is clearly unsatisfactory. But um, but things are, are really moving apace on the on the climate side of things. And the TCFD, which is sort of precursor of the TNFD that Clinton uh, referred to, uh, again that framework is already much much sort of clearer, becoming more embedded, uh, becoming required by, for example, UK sort of uh, financial reporting regulator. Um, so I think the whole nature focused sort of um, process, including obviously the biodiversity is quite a long way behind that. Our hope is that everybody involved in, for example, ventures like the TNFD, which is again, trying to produce a more coherent uh, and, and sort of a comprehensive nature-based reporting system. Our hope is that those frameworks will sort of piggyback on the learnings from the carbon side of things uh, and therefore be able to sort of uh, accelerate much more rapidly and we won't have to wait another 10 years for a, a really comprehensive uh, reporting system and i think efforts by for example the ifrs foundation uh, to set up a sustainability uh, standards board or at least they say they're considering it but i, I think they've probably probably made up their mind they're going to do it um, that that's very encouraging because again i think one of the key challenges from an investment perspective you know, before I joined Planet Tracker, I was working for organizations like JP Morgan and uh, as, a, as an equity analyst, in fact, and, and gathering the data and getting comprehensive and um, comparable and consistent data is a massive, massive challenge at the moment with companies reporting voluntarily. They'll, they'll change their metrics, they'll report one year, not the next year, they won't do the same as the rest of the peer group and, and so on and so forth. And some of that is, is interesting and innovative chaos <laughs> But a lot of it is just chaos, and it makes it very, very difficult for uh, for investors uh, and and sort of policymakers and you know government officials and whatever. It makes it very difficult for people to really get a clear assessment. So we absolutely need a really clear, comprehensive, and compulsory framework uh, for corporate reporting. Uh, we can't rely on voluntary codes anymore. I think we need governments to step in and say these are the key data points that we actually need to see. And until we get that, it will be very difficult to, uh, you know, I sympathize with Erica trying to sort of, you know, measure companies' uh, biodiversity impacts. And we can, like she was suggesting, you can say, well, that, that company probably has a big impact on biodiversity. Let's see if we can work out whether it's sort of, you know, net benefit or net, net harmful. Um, but it would be much more straightforward if we had better, more comprehensive reporting across the piece. Yeah. Okay, so what I hear from, from all your answers is that what, what we do so far, and we, let's say, I mean, humankind, but also we as investment professionals and the investment community, uh, it is insufficient, right? So far, it is insufficient. We agree on the relevance, we agree that something needs to be done. Peter, in your answer, uh, you said the word hope um, in the beginning too often. So um, we, we, we need to act, right? And you, you touched upon regulators, Peter. And um, so, I mean, so it, may, it may take a while until regulators really, um, really bring this into, into law or into rules. So what is the urgent next steps? Is it companies itself? Is it the investors? Um, so how, how do we better punish um, bad behavior? Because so far, it's hard. Sorry, Axel, I missed, uh, missed your very last sentence there, I think. So, so the last sentence is, we, we don't really see the investors caring enough because we don't punish companies that are inactive in preserving biodiversity Otherwise, you would see it in demand for their um, for their stocks, for example, right? Which I think we do, it is not sufficient so far that can be done here. So, what is the urgent next next step for the investment community? Yeah, I think it's a good question, um, and and it is a tough one because obviously the investment community is is very diverse. Investors are. Um, by and large, commercial organisations, um, sort of the 
the asset owners standing behind them maybe have a slightly less sort of commercial uh, view of life. But ultimately, they're all wanting to generate returns for, for their customers and, uh, and bonuses for, for the employees. Um, and left to their own devices, I think change could well be slow. I mean, if you look at organizations like Elgin, um, you can see that they are sort of leaders rather than laggards in terms of the ESG space. Um, and I think, uh, you know, one one would hope that uh, that is motivated by people like Clinton sort of throughout the organization wanting to do the right thing. There's probably a commercial motive there as well. Um, and I think if you look at capital flows across the market, you can see that there is a big trend from retail investors and from asset owners like pension funds to invest their, their capital uh, with sustainability much more sort of embedded in their investment process and their desired investment outcomes. And so investment managers like Elgin and, and many others are beginning to respond to that. We saw recently BlackRock, I think, making quite a significant change, having previously said some nice things and perhaps done less of them. Now you feel that it, a large organization like that is really beginning to put sort of uh, meat on the bones in terms of their actions. Um, so I think we'll see a shift just driven by commercial pressures and commercial opportunities uh, across the investment space. Um, but that in itself will likely not be enough and will likely be far too slow. So the other side of it, I suspect, is that sort of civil society, uh, you and me as voters, uh, we will have to lobby our governments uh, and our, and our, our politicians uh, to take action as well. Um, and that's where, you know, organizations like Erica's and, and, and others in the NGO space as well uh, really have a great opportunity to supply the, the ammunition and the information. And one of the things that really encourages me about a lot of this is that in the past, supply chains were essentially invisible. And that's been a massive challenge when you've got a big say, a retail company at one end facing off to consumers and doing something with all the effects hidden in the supply chain and being effectively committed uh, by independent suppliers. And now we've got the technologies uh, in terms of sort of the way they can be displayed on sort of web pages, tracked with blockchain and all these other different sort of what you might call quasi social media sort of systems coming together. We can actually begin to knit all that information together and actually show people uh, what's going on. And I think people will be empowered by that information or can be. Uh, and if they then start to take action, both in terms of how they spend their money and also how they yeah. place their votes, that will begin to have an effect. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Because it's interesting because you touch upon investors and um, and also consumer preferences, right? So, so Clinton, do you already see a shift there in investors' preferences and how big is it? Yeah, so th there's a couple of points actually that Peter touched on that I, I think are worth picking up. So I think civil society can play quite a strong role and, and there's numerous avenues that they can play. I think the first thing is, uh, most individuals will have a pension and I think start by looking who's managing your pension and look what that investment manager is actually doing when it comes to biodiversity. Are you happy with that? Otherwise start to speak to them. Um, you know, I think I think the question of sort of supply chains uh, is becoming more, more visible as Peter mentioned. So again, as a consumer, where are you shopping? What is that um, food stores policy when it comes to supply chains and deforestation? Do they have something in place? If not, shop somewhere else. Um, so I just want to say, like the civil society has quite a powerful role to play, and I think individuals need to sort of figure out that they can do a lot more. Um, coming back to some of the other points in terms of just sort of regulators and governments, you know, admittedly to now, you could you could cynically say efforts haven't been good enough. If you look at sort of the um, the IG 2020 biodiversity targets, we've met almost none of those, um, but. It's, it's on the radar now, arguably more, more than it's ever been before. You've got the European Commission's 2030 plan, you know, you've got your SFDR, um, you've got your CBD COP, you've got your climate change COP. It's all happening this year. So the visibility is much higher. In terms of what we hear from clients and, and people who invest with us, biodiversity has risen up the ranks quite a lot. Um, and I think this is, this is Partly, I'm, I'm thinking just looking now versus a year ago, partly it's just because it's starting to filter into more mainstream media. You've got David Attenborough putting programs on the TV. You're seeing adverts about biodiversity. So it has risen up into you know, the collective mind, I want to say, of society that this is something that we need to address. Um, I think there's still a disconnect between what, what it is we need to do 
to actually address this. But we're in a, um, optimistically, I say, a better position than we were a year ago in terms of um, visibility. And I guess the more people that ask about biodiversity and want uh, asset managers, investment managers to do something, the more of a mandate there is to do something. Um, so again, you know, in terms of how, how we would um, consider this when engaging with companies and biodiversity is uh, one of the topics we'll speak to them about. You've got a lot of levers you can pull. You can vote against them. You can have powerful engagements either on your own or as part of a collective engagement. So there's a lot of um, levers that asset managers can pull. And, and as it's increasing in prominence, I expect to see or I hope to see that this is something that's going to happen more. Yeah. Uh, I will come to proxy voting and general meetings in a bit. But before that, I wanted to ask Erica. So what Clinton said, that the awareness arises and the demand shifts, um, this should mean that you have more business, right? Do you see it in demand for your services? Um, we, yes, I mean, uh, since, uh, since last year, in fact, um, there are more and more requests on, uh, on specific topic uh, so ESG before it was a, a huge, large uh, item, and now um, people and investors are more focused on uh, specific uh, criteria, specific item, specific subject. Uh, so in fact, there is a there is a trend um, in which uh, investors and uh, for sure consumers are more and more uh, educated, uh, so they they can go deep. Uh, on, the, on all the subject and do not focus only on ES and G. And um, just to, to come back on, on another thing, so for what concern companies, on the other hand, uh, it's, I think it's really hard for them uh, to have a standard uh, view and a standard uh, regulation. So we do not have a standard for biodiversity. We do not have indicators that are precise and focused for, uh, for all companies. For, for some companies, uh, a good indicator would be uh, the percentage of products that has a certification for sustainable fishing. And for another company, it could be uh, the creation of a green belt uh, around the, the, the exploitation zones. So also for, uh, for, from our side, uh, it's a little bit uh, uh, challenging to, to find the proper and precise indicator to analyze the, the protection of biodiversity for, for all sector and for all company. Uh, so again, uh, what uh, Peter was saying is it's really true. Uh, so consumer investors can put a, um, really an accelerator on, uh, on, this, um, on this process of uh, you know, having awareness of biodiversity and its importance in economics. Uh, but I think it's really important also to have um, a structured uh, and uh, standard view on what it is, what we need to, uh, to take in consideration, what we need to use. And, uh, and here we, we still have to work on that. So it's, uh, it's a work in progress. Then if we look at some years ago, um, everybody was talking about uh, climate and ESG, but it was uh, really uh, on the mist. So we, we, we didn't know what it was, uh, how, how to deal with it. And uh, now more and more talking about it, making conferences, uh, it's, it's getting clearer and clearer and it's getting more regulated. So as Clinton once say, this year, it's really um, a year where everyone is really focused on biodiversity. So I think and I'm positive uh, saying that, that in the next uh, few years, we will see a uh, growing uh, awareness and, uh, and precise rules on that, because it's really hard also for investors to, to know what uh, they have to look at. But, but in indexing, um, Erica, if you, if you would have the task to, to put a biodiversity score on a broad equity index, a broad set of companies, yeah. And probably have exactly this problem that you mentioned, right? That biodiversity means different things to other to different companies. So what are what are um, general cr criteria that you look at? So for the moment, uh, we we really look at uh, the, the implication and the policies of, uh, of the biodiversity. Um, indeed, last year we launched the, the, the biodiversity index with uh, with selective. So it's already a little bit, a uh, little step uh, in the direction of doing something. Uh, 
uh, for biodiversity. Um, so basically, we really look at uh, the, the policies that the company has and its implementation. So if uh, there are measures uh, put in place for the company, we look at controversies. So if the companies uh, react, uh, if there is an accident, how it reacts, uh, how the severe the controversy is uh, to protect investors from uh, reputation risks, uh, et cetera. And we avoid, uh, so we excluded some, uh, some companies uh, that had uh, uh, some involvement, for example, in NGOs, uh, MGOs uh, or um, animal mistreatment uh, or activities that could uh, have a, a negative impact uh, on biodiversity. And on the other side, we want to promote uh, as I was saying before, uh, some, some companies that were uh, proposing uh, services and uh, products uh, that are good for biodiversity, like afforestation, or uh, I was saying before, uh, bio-based chemicals or organic fertilizers, these kind of, uh, of companies. So for, uh, of course, this is uh, one possible way as we were saying that there, there is no standards, there is no uh, unique view. Uh, biodiversity is a, a really large uh, subject uh, that can be approached uh, from uh, different angles and, uh, and approaches. Uh, so it's one way. Uh, there are uh, for sure a million of other ways uh, possible, uh, but I think it's important to, to try to imagine this these strategies uh, for indices, uh, for of course, for investment strategies, it works uh, as well. Uh, but it is important to start to do this exercise and work with what we have. Uh, that could be um, simply some policies uh, that is general for, uh, for all companies, instead of focusing on uh, specific uh, items and uh, specific indicators, for example. To, to, to all of you, has it reached proxy voting and annual general meetings? Um, yeah, I can I, I can uh, say a few things there. It, it has um, reached AGMs and voting, perhaps not under the obvious term of biodiversity, but I think more is the underlying components. So um, one of the reports that I was reading, for example, was saying between 2016 and 2020, you had 49 proposals um, uh, related to biodiversity, and, but under the kind of heading, so to speak, of packaging and pollution or deforestation or water use and pesticides. So um, it has hit the AGMs, not, not explicitly under biodiversity yet. I think that might be something where the link is made a little bit stronger going forward, but um, it has happened there. And, you know, 2020, you, you had a lot uh, of important votes there um, with, as, as take deforestation, for example, you had the Procter & Gamble vote, which received around 68%, which is, is quite a strong vote. So I think it's, it's on people's radar um, and it is pitching up at the AGMs, yeah. Peter, do you confirm? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I echo Clinton's comments. I mean, we focus from our, our sort of selfish perspective, we focus uh, less on on, on voting at, uh, at AGMs and, and more on sort of investor policies themselves and, and, in, and investor behavior, if you like. Um, but I think I think he's he's absolutely correct that at the moment, biodiversity itself is not really sort of hitting the headlines. Um, but there are some encouraging signs of uh, of investors being much more sort of active around, for example, deforestation. And I think deforestation is actually a very helpful um, sort of uh, entry point, if you like, into biodiversity, because it's conceptually easy. You're chopping down trees. They should remain standing. That's a sort of simple concept. Um, and, and we know that if you chop down, uh, you know, a, a rainforest or a, an old forest in sort of, you know, Europe or, or America or wherever, you are automatically destroying a significant habitat that's been there for years. So again, it's it's very easy to sort of see that that would reduce biodiversity, uh, and that's because it has a link to climate. Obviously, again, that's that's a reasonably well trodden path. And there are now quite a lot of companies that have deforestation policies or policies for avoiding deforestation, and there are a lot of investors uh, that are also uh, very focused on requiring their uh, invest investee companies to have those policies. So we've already got that link. 
I mean, it's interesting, there's a lot more we could do. I mean, there was a recent um, report by I think it was Global Canopy Forest 500 report uh, that was highlighting the fact that probably only about a third of, of large investors have a, de a specific deforestation policy uh, in place, um, which, is, which is a shockingly low number given how long we've, we've known that deforestation is a, is a problem. Um, so I think there's some very easy steps that, uh, that investors and companies could take uh, without maybe, as Erica was pointing out, grappling with the whole of biodiversity. Uh, you know, we can start doing things now, even before we've got the perfect world of perfect data and consistent reporting that we were imagining earlier. Great, thanks. We have an interesting question from the audience, uh, which was already raised a couple of minutes ago, and I would like to motivate again um, everyone to, to ask questions if you have any. So the question is that the, the problem seems to be twofold. The, it is not possible to put a price tag on all the services that the ecosystem delivers. So when you can't put prices on goods or on things, services, then you often have market failure, right? Because um, often you also have externalities. So these externalities are then often ignored by decision makers and investment uh, managers, right? Because if you pollute something and there's no price for it, you may do so, right? That um, also refers to the COS uh, theorem loosely. So the question is, do we need policymakers to step in? Or do we need to educate on what's actually happening? What do we need to do first is the question. I think, well, I'll, I'll share some thoughts. It might not hit the nail on the head. Um, it's a difficult one with, with what must come first between policymakers or um, education. Because I think if you take it quite back, and hopefully this isn't too controversial, um, I think GDP as a whole is just too focused on growth and consumption, return on investment, and it's largely ignoring the value that's sort of created or depleted um, that's, that's not captured by market prices. So you've got healthy oceans, forests, that's kind of being overlooked. And so I think because of that, we're not pricing many aspects of biodiversity at all, and therefore we're not valuing it at all. And I think an interesting um, comment from the Descripta Review example was, um, about a third of all food goes to waste, which is really saying something about the fact that we're clearly not valuing it appropriately if we're, if we're okay or allowing that to happen. Um, so I think that's a big problem. I think things are starting to change. You've had that um, study by uh, a Dutch bank where they sort of mapped the GDP to um, uh, nature, relate where it's highly or um, moderately dependent on nature, and they've come to a figure of around 44 trillion. Um, so there's also so there's that as sort of the top level, and you've started you've got the smaller kind of tools that can map specific sectors and what's their dependency on nature. So we're starting to get some figures there, but this this remains quite a complex problem. So I don't see this um, being changed overnight. And I think as long as it's difficult to put a value on something like biodiversity, which I foresee it possibly could still continue to be for a while, it's going to be a challenge. Um, so. Yeah, that's not answering the question as a whole, but I think we need to sort of start there. The education piece, they probably need to run together. Um, the education piece about the importance of biodiversity and the need to value it, that, that is coming alongside. But um, I think ultimately, we, we hope that regulators sort of step in at some stage and try and put more concrete policies around this because um, you can leave it to the market to figure out, but, but then you could also raise the question, well, look where that's got us. Um, uh, so, you know, just, just some points that spring to mind. Fair point. Yeah, I think those are very uh, fair points, Clinton. And I think it's, it's interesting. People, I think people sometimes feel that, you know, reg regulation and sort of the legal environment is a, is a thing that has already always existed uh, and, and therefore it's sort of uh, impossible to change or, or question. Um, but if you imagine if there were no land rights across Europe, for example, um, so there was no private property and there was no government property. You could just wander into anybody's garden and sort of take their food because it wasn't theirs. It was just whoever wanted it. 
um, you can immediately see how we would we would get to a very sort of extractive set of behaviors because I wouldn't need to grow my own food. I could just steal it from my neighbor and there would be no consequences. Now, obviously, they sorted that out several thousand years ago and put up fences and decided whose vegetables belong to whom and what the consequence was of stealing somebody's sheep. Um, and, and in essence, we need uh, our, our economic and our legal system to expand its horizons and think about nature uh, in a much more comprehensive way. Now, going back to what Clinton was saying, that's going to take a long time, potentially. Um, but I think if we can start that thinking process now, as, for example, the Das Gupta review is, is really helpful in, in sort of framing that. We've had other really interesting sort of policy papers coming out from people. You know, mentioned the Dutch bank study. And all of these, these sort of thought pieces are really helpful in, in shifting the opinion, the Overton windows, they often talk about it in politics, just getting people to begin to accept that nature is valuable and should be valued. Uh, and, and then simple examples, again, like you mentioned, Clinton, the food waste, which is just bizarre how much we just literally pull out of the field and put on the plate and then throw straight in the bin. We wouldn't do that with oil. Uh, we wouldn't do that with lithium. We wouldn't do that with, uh, with currency. Um, and yet we do that with sort of, you know, fish and chips and burgers and vegetables and all the rest of it. You know, those are those are sort of illustrations of the systemic failure that we've got because we're not really thinking about things correctly. So education is clearly important. I think that is already happening, to be honest. I think uh, those of us beyond the education system are sort of educating ourselves. Uh, people like Clinton is diving back in, clearly still sort of digging into it. Um, so that is beginning to happen and that will flow through towards the policymakers. But I think it goes back actually to the point that Clinton made earlier, which I thought was a really good one which is you know, each of us as individuals, we are actors in civil society. We can allocate our money uh, in support of our beliefs and, and we, can, we can lobby our politicians in support of that as well. And that will have a much more rapid uh, effect. Yeah, and if I may add, uh, as, uh, as for climate, um, we have the feelings, we as, a, as a people in general, is, a, is the, the classic problem, uh, the tragedy of the commons. So we have the feelings that uh, these, uh, these uh, resources are illimited, but in fact, uh, there, is a, there is a limit uh, and uh, we are not valuing it. So we are treating them as it's uh, infinite, uh, but it's not. And, uh, and of course, this uh, creates some economic problems behind, so we cannot associate the cost. Uh, even if there are a lot of uh, a lot of theories and papers that try to assign um, a value on the natural capital, and uh, so that is the main uh, the main problem. If we look at uh, what happened with uh, with climate, uh, we we still do not have the carbon taxes, uh, for example. Uh, flights are uh, still cheaper. Well, except in, at COVID, because uh, now flights are. A little bit uh, uh, not possible to fly, um, but flights are uh, normally cheaper than trains. Even if uh, the the emission we we perfectly know that are uh, much more uh, higher. So uh, the, the the thing the simple thing of putting a cost on it it might not uh, solve the the entire problem. Uh, I, I really believe that education and uh, the push of uh, investors and uh, and consumers is uh, is crucial. It's really it's really important. Okay. Let me come to my second last question, and th there are two questions from the audience which I think we tried to cover already. So let me rephrase them a little bit and make a personal question for Erica out of it. So the questions are. Um, one is, how do companies in less obvious biodiversity impact sectors actually measure their impact? So that's data and how we um, generalize data, right? And on what um, solutions are data providers working at the moment? So and like I said, um, very personal question, you, Erica, your daily work, what do you, and not Vijay Aris, but Erica, uh, what does Erica do in uh, this respect uh, in your daily work? So what's what's your next step? Um, what are you working on? So um, in terms of, uh, of research, 
um, so I, I do not work in research. I'm on, on the other side. Uh, so I work for a creating a solution for, a, for, a, for clients uh, on indices. Uh, so the idea is really to, um, to analyze deeper uh, what are the information that the companies provide um, and find uh, other um, NGOs or other uh, uh, companies and actors that might have uh, some more detailed data uh, in terms of, uh, of biodiversity. This could be, uh, could be a solution uh, to find something um, even more, uh, more scientific or uh, more detailed. Uh, this could be a, this could be a, a solution for, for the next steps. Um, we try to, to mix, as I said before, uh, our daily, daily job is really to find, um, try to put together all the different angles uh, that we can imagine on, on one specific topic. That could be biodiversity, it could be uh, more deeply on ocean or more deeply on agriculture, for example, and try to, uh, to find all the different uh, subjects that could be aligned and connected to this. And um, and of course, we can do it by analyzing more uh, deeply uh, what are the the company's information. Uh, sometimes some companies do not have a lot of information on that, so it's 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 quite hard also sometimes to find uh, because the awareness is not so high. Uh, and of course, uh, yes, taking contacts with with other organizations that are more. Um, on the topic and scientifically or or NGOs, it could be uh, it will be uh, the next steps for us. And spreading knowledge through webinars. Um, Clinton, similar question to you. What are you personally contributing? Sure. So I think um, at at the moment, most of the contribution. Um, so an area I've been covering is so, say the food sector as part of our climate impact pledge, and for example, there. Um, we have been engaging with food companies. It's been focused on climate, but there's been a lot of overlap there with biodiversity. So kiosks would be things like, um, you know, do you have deforestation policies? Are you looking into regenerative agriculture? Um, are your portfolios, are you, are you thinking about pivoting slightly away from meat intensive portfolios? So um, that, that's kind of one aspect. And I think that's the more established aspect that touches on biodiversity. I think looking forward, um, this topic is massive, so it, it, it's quite key to try and break off pieces that we can work on, but not get too overwhelmed. Um, so looking forward, we're really trying to see what bits we can work on in some of the other sectors as well. As I mentioned, we've um, joined the TNFD in, as an observer member, um, so we can try and help with some of those conversations. But then we're also going to be looking at other areas that I think are key to biodiversity, such as like plastic pollution is another example. Um, we're doing some work on sustainable aquaculture. Um, so it's it's a little bit across the board at this stage. Um, like I say, it's it's quite a complex area. So it's important to just kind of take a step back and try and see what you can achieve without trying to sort of do it all, because I think um, it will be quite easy to get lost. Okay. Peter, same question to you. Yeah, well, I'm again interested in the points that, that Clinton was mentioning because Planet Tracker has uh, well three, three or three and a half themes that uh, that we're looking at. So we're looking at land use uh, with a particular focus on the beef and soy supply chains and the the deforestation impact they have, which obviously then has climate impact and and obviously biodiversity. We're looking at oceans. Uh, so I was interested by your comment on sustainable aquaculture. Uh, we're looking both at sort of fish farming and also the way that uh, deep deep sea ocean fishing is is progressing. Uh, and then we've got a materials track where we're looking at the textiles supply chain, which has a very, very heavy environmental footprint, a lot of pollution, which again will have a significant impact on biodiversity. Um, and uh, and then at the other end of the spectrum, we're, we're looking at plastics and particularly at the waste uh, that's coming out of the sort of the plastic supply chain and obviously textiles to an extent uh, meshes with plastics both at the beginning and the end uh, and all of these have impacts on both on climate change but also particularly on on sort of abuse of, of, of nature's boundaries if you like in terms of water consumption pollution and um, biodiversity loss uh, and so our focus is very much on digging into uh, the impacts that these supply chains are having the companies operating in them 
um, and then linking that to uh, the capital allocation that's coming into those companies. So if we can show lenders, for example, um, that they really should be charging more for their loans because of the risks uh, that they are themselves capturing or all the sort of poor environmental behaviors that they're supporting, and we, we can do the same on the equity side as well. So it's providing information. And I was interested by what uh, Erica said in terms of, you know, where do you get information from? Our ambition is to be uh, one of those potential data sources for, uh, for companies like Digio Iris so that they can come to us and say, help us, uh, help us to understand what you've discovered. And usually we find we're a fairly small organization and the bigger companies will take our methodologies and uh, industrialize it, but at least we can sort of, we can show the way that's the ambition. Okay, great. So I have the impression that we, that we really are here a group of um, interested experts in this field. However, more needs to be done for the broad um, community. Uh, however, I want to ask a quickly yes or no question. If we would do this webinar in five years again, um, would we get even more um, participants on the webinar or put it differently? Will the awareness for the further increase? Yes. No? Yes. I think, uh, I hope that in five years, everybody knows about biodiversity and we don't need to do a wet beaner. Yeah. But I think it's, uh, it's too much. Uh, so um, yes, for sure, for sure. Yeah, to totally agree with both. I think it's a, it's a, yes, we probably will have more participants in an ideal world. People would look and go, I know all that. Why should I turn up? Yeah. Great. No, let's, let's do, let's do a lot of work towards uh, reaching this um, so that, that everyone is educated uh, in five years and that we um, would love to speak again about this topic, but maybe the necessity um, could even decrease, right? That would be the ideal world. Okay, great. Um, so thanks for, for all of, um, of you to, to join here. Uh, thanks to our listeners. Uh, I, I want to, um, to, to make one comment about this uh, webinar series. So the selective ESG webinar series continues next week. So this was the first one. Next week is the second one um, on the topic of um, general diversity and um, so on social inequalities. And I'm happy to, to, to see a lot of little faces there again, although I will only be a listener. Um, however, let me conclude here with uh, saying thanks to all of you. It was great um, hosting this. It was great doing this discussion with you. So um, Erica, Clinton, Peter, thank you very much. Great pleasure. Thank thanks you. for inviting us.